and welcome back to another one of our online lectures here in History Through Film. Today we're going to continue our unit on warfare by looking at medieval warfare. So we've got two learning targets we're going to seek to try to answer here today. The first one says, summarize the warfare techniques and strategies used in the medieval world. We're going to look at all sorts of good stuff, different tactics, different fortifications, different weapons used in the medieval world. So we'll have plenty that we can use to answer that question. The second one, though, is bringing back Sun Tzu. Uh, it says, compare and contrast ancient, medieval, and modern warfare based on Sun Tzu's principles. Uh, so, realistically, Sun Tzu uh, really is the cornerstone of this whole unit. We watched The Art of War already, uh, but what we want to do is take his ideas and see how they filter in um, into each of our eras of warfare. Maybe some of those are very common, and we see them pop up in all three. Uh, so you definitely want to be uh, using your uh, Sun Tzu principles uh, that we looked at on the art of war uh, as a guide for that. If you notice in the bottom left corner it says this lecture information will need to be included on your unit assessment. So make sure you're taking good notes along the way because I will need to see this information referenced later on in the unit. So how are we going to do this? Well, here's our kind of a roadmap, what we will learn. Uh, we're going to briefly talk about some changes from ancient warfare. Uh, we're going to look at siege warfare on the offensive side, siege warfare on the defensive side. We'll briefly touch on knights and naval warfare, and then we'll talk about why the medieval warfare ended, what changed, um, what would have signaled a, a new beginning in warfare, um, and, and what that really meant for the people. So that's kind of where we're going with all of this. So let's start with changes from ancient warfare and causes of ancient warfare. So causes of change. Well, one of the big things is the invention of the stirrup. Uh, the stirrup allowed you to ride your horse and uh, certainly gives you an advantage on the battlefield if more and more of your men could be cavalry, could be on horseback. So uh, it allowed you to have a large cavalry, um, improved mobility on horseback, you could ride uh, swifter, you could certainly wield a, a sword. The stirrups kind of help, helped you stay on the horse, of course. Um, a lot of this was done, uh, the changes were made because they wanted to make sure people survived against the Mongols, and so as to combat the steppe nomads or the Mongols and some Islamic Arab empires that were very dominant uh, during the Middle Ages. Uh, so a lot of times warfare is reactionary. It's, it's saying, hey, how can we defeat a group that's more advanced than us? And sometimes you come up with new techniques because of that. Certainly European and Japanese feudalism played a role in this. That's where you have knights and samurai, as you suggest here. Um, they were warriors. They were warriors for life. They were uh, essentially like bodyguards. Uh, and so their skills and their strategies will improve from the olden days from ancient warfare. Uh, and part of the reason for that is there's constant conflict. Constant conflict led to faster development of new weaponry. So if you're constantly fighting, you're always looking for a new way to improve and try to defeat your enemy. Therefore, you're going to just have advancements uh, in your weaponry, in your armor, in your strategies, and all of those different things. Continuing on, uh, there's no doubt that uh, medieval warfare is more organized than ancient warfare, and that's a big key. You're going to see uh, large armies on the battlefield, but large didn't necessarily mean by the tens and hundreds of thousands. Um, certainly a small group of knights, 5,000 or 10,000, could be a very large, formidable force. Um, there's definitely going to be greater attempts at lines of communication. You're going to try to... Uh, communicate. This is still rudimentary. You don't have any type of telephone or anything like that, but you signal fires. Uh, you would certainly use messengers uh, to try to communicate between armies and, and maybe even outflank your enemy uh, if you have the opportunity to do so. So musical signals, audible commands, messengers, or even visual signals such as raising a standard banner or flag. And oftentimes you'll see uh, armies marching into battle with banners or flags, and that was done for pride. It might represent the clan or tribe that you are fighting for, but sometimes those banners or flags could be visual signals for a lot of different things, uh, and that was very, very important. It's also allowed for greater attempts to uh, counterattacks. You come up with new weaponry, new uh, techniques, and, and certainly uh, new equipment that would attempt to stop your enemy from even getting to you. Uh, you see an example here 
Um, we've got the Cheval de Free, uh, which is essentially kind of like a roadblock. Uh, be very difficult to get around if built properly, um, and it would stall the invading army. Um, you'd also have pikemen. Pikemen, like we talked about in my world history class uh, with the uh, Greeks and eventually with Macedonian leader King Philip II, uh, took eight-foot pikes and put those on the front line of his uh, marching infantry, and that would push back an army as well. Uh, so there's no doubt that pikemen and, and different equipment were used to try to stop or at least stifle the enemy from marching towards you. Um, ranged infantry uh, are definitely going to be a big part of this. Uh, ranged infantry are people who can uh, use all sorts of different weapons to uh, break the uh, enemy lines open. Uh, you'd use your cavalry, of course, to break through the lines, outflank your enemy, um, avoid your enemy maybe, and even surprise your enemy. But of course, the nice thing about having a horse would be if you do need to escape, if you do need to retreat, it meant that you were going to do so rather quickly. Now, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, battles weren't always large. You're not talking about 100,000 troops here. Uh, when you've got knights and you've got armor and you've got a lot of weaponry, it's going to be a very expensive endeavor. So sometimes 10,000 soldiers was a very, very large battle. Uh, that might not seem like very much compared to some of the other ancient battles that existed, but here in medieval warfare, um, armor and weaponry is a game changer, so you didn't need as many troops. Now, there's going to be a lot of different fortifications. Obviously, you're going to have many castles built during the medieval period. Um, castles were created due to constant warfare, and castles would evolve. You'd have the star-shaped forts. You'd have castles with all sorts of different moats and um, all sorts. Of, we're going to look at quite a few of these different changes that come up here, but they evolve over time. Um, castles were not glamorous. They were essentially large bunkers. Um, we have this romantic look at castles today, but castles were built for protection, uh, number one. I mean, that's what they were built for. So they weren't exactly built to be beautiful and, um, you know, something that future generations would enjoy. Uh, many start out as walled hilltops uh, and eventually uh, as stone and masonry were able to be added to. They were built up um, as stone walls. Uh, many of these castles controlled the lord's lands or, or lord's retainers' property, including uh, the peasants inside. Uh, peasants would work inside. The knights would uh, patrol and, and you know, make sure everybody was protected. Uh, and the lord, landowner, essentially would uh, pay for the whole thing. Importance of castles, they're expensive, uh, but very, very difficult to defeat. Uh, if your walls were built properly, they could withstand... Um, a, a lot of different force. You didn't have gunpowder yet, so you're not shooting cannons at them yet, although the ver various different uh, catapults and things like that certainly could do some damage uh, to your castle walls. Siege engines were very expensive, so uh, in order to fight against a castle, you needed to spend a lot of money to do so. So we're going to talk about the offensive weapons here in a little bit, including different siege uh, engines that would be used. Here's a couple different examples, kind of the um, evolution of the fort or the castle. You can see you might start sort of with your moat around uh, water outside. Of course, crossing water, especially if you've got a lot of armor, might be difficult, and horses. But you can see a pretty simple wooden fence, essentially, around the outside. Eventually, you move to uh, a stone keep. You build up your walls. You've got your spires here that you can put archers or scouts in there. Uh, and if you're really advanced, you can build even an outer wall. Um, so you essentially have two walls that the enemy has to um, break through. And that, in a way, it's not impossible, but it becomes very, very difficult to do so. All right, let's talk about siege warfare on the offensive side. Uh, this is where you're going to see a lot of similarities to Kingdom of Heaven and some things we're going to see in Braveheart. Uh, so you can see Siege Warfare here in this image. So what are the things we're going to look at? Well, I'm going to provide you a list here, and, and then we're going to go through each one of these one by one, and I'll show you some pictures of them. Um, so different siege engines, we're going to look at scaling ladders, battering rams, siege towers, uh, the mangonel, which is essentially like a catapult, the uh, onager, which is similar to a mangonel, uh, ballista, trebuchet, and uh, siege mining. So I'm going to just kind of walk you through each one of these, just have some images for you. And I think the pictures kind of do the talking for me. I mean, it, a lot of these uh, are very self-explanatory, 
but of course it would all in, involve um, you know somebody building them, designing them, and it would take time and money to do so. So it's not like you just had access to a whole bunch of these. You didn't just have a uh, warehouse filled with siege towers that you can use. A lot of these had to be constructed right on the battlefield, which certainly would slow your warfare down uh, and leave you prone to the enemy coming outside of their walls and maybe attacking you, which they didn't really want to do, but it did happen in some cases. So scaling ladders, you can see here, a uh, ladder is very simple. It's meant for you to get over the wall. And uh, this would be a very simple construction, but um, <laughs> you didn't necessarily want to be the first guy up the ladder, of course, because that uh, made you a very easy target for arrows and swords and all sorts of different things. Uh, but if you sent enough men and enough ladders up at the same time, uh, you could eventually breach a wall. Battering ram, battering ram, uh, you know, you would bring to the weak spot of your wall, maybe to a door, and you'd have several men, as you'd see here, uh, pushing back a very heavy object like a, a log or a, a you know tree trunk to try to eventually break through. Of course, that leaves you very wide open from above. So sometimes you saw battering rams that were protected, that were covered, um, that would you know provide protection from arrows and raining down rocks and things like that. Siege towers. Siege towers were very advanced, um, very difficult to build, but could also be very successful. So essentially, you'd put a bunch of men up here, and you'd wheel this protected over to the wall, and you'd put down this drawbridge, and you'd be able to walk right across the wall like you see here. A lot of times, they used rawhide to protect them, to protect the men from arrow fire, or even from fire itself. Um, but of course, if your siege towers are on fire, there wasn't much you could do. Um, so you would need multiple siege towers. Building one usually wasn't going to be enough. Unless it was a small-scale war, um, you might need several siege towers. And you can imagine the manpower and uh, resources you would need to build something like that. Catapults. Here's where we've got all sorts of different catapults. I mentioned the uh, mangonel here. Uh, you've got the ballista, which is essentially you know, a torsion-powered, um, almost like missile launcher. Uh, you would twist back this, these uh, turnstiles. You'd have ropes made out of animal sinew, and they'd pull back, and when you'd release it, of course, it would launch um, any type of projectile that you wanted, typically some type of um, spear maybe that could um, penetrate uh, walls. It could penetrate people. It could penetrate siege towers. It could do a lot of things. Um, here you've got the trebuchet which is basically you've got a counterweight. It's like a big sling. It's kind of like a catapult, but a little bit different. Um, Oxabelles, which is sort of the, uh, the Greeks call it the uh, skin penetrator, kind of very similar uh, to the ballista here. Uh, so here's just a lot of different versions of catapults. Now, siege mining, this one was an interesting one because, of course, uh, if you can't go over the wall, you might as well try going under it. Very time-heavy... Um, <laughs> endeavor you would need to dig and dig and dig and of course you never knew if it was gonna uh, your wall was gonna collapse or your tunnel was gonna collapse uh, but if you can't go over the wall you could try to sneak attack them by going under it um, so that did happen once in a while okay we're gonna end part one there um, when we come back we're gonna look at siege warfare on the defensive side we'll briefly then talk about knights and naval warfare, and then we'll talk about why uh, medieval warfare ends. So you can go ahead and hit stop and queue up part two.